life of Saul or Paul. Just a reminder, I, for years I used to think, oh, Saul was when he was a sinner, when he was persecuting the church. Paul was after he really followed Jesus. You too. Okay, sis, Sister Lisa said, yeah, that's what I thought too. You know, we, we think all sorts of things about the Bible at times, and it's okay just to admit I don't know everything. Pastors still admit that. Um, but as we reminded you, as we said last week, so Saul is his Hebrew name. Paul is the Greek slash Roman name that he identifies with more later as he begins to uh, um, have more and more to do with the Greek speaking with Greek speaking communities at that time and with with Gentiles as we would say at that time. So we'll be saying Saul. If I say Paul, you know it's the same person, okay? And um, because I'm just a genius with letters. We, we, it's one of my gifts. Um, we have the four C's, or for me anyhow, it's an easy way to remember for those of, at least, of, of us at least who are English speaking. In this section of Saul or Paul's life, an easy way to think about how he, he changes from being the, the persecutor of the church, a murderer, as he himself says, to becoming just as sold out, as zealous, and devoted to God and to, uh, to the way, as, as the church was called in the early days. Chapter 9, these few verses show us what happened. So for me, and just in my thinking, I've got four C's. So just for a quick review, we started this last week. Uh, would you turn off these lights, please? These should not be on. Right here. Ho oh, ho. No wonder it's hot up here. <laughs> Okay, if you think you're warm, you should be preaching. It's always, it's about 10 degrees warmer when you preach. So, uh, so this comes from chapter 9, and we'll do some review, and I want to bring in some other things as well as we look at this. So four C's, this is in your notes, and if you want to, uh, it's at the bottom of the, pa of the front of the page, and if you want to switch over to the back side, then we'll go through this uh, quick review, but we'll also add some other things into this section now. So the first part we looked at in this chapter 9 was this, the campaign, and this comes from Saul's side. He is, uh, the one thing we can say for sure about Saul is he is completely sold out to what he's doing. There's nothing wishy-washy about this man. Have you ever met somebody like that before, in whatever way? They kind of drive you crazy, don't they? You know, we look back and we think, wow, Paul was such a great, or whatever. I don't think... At, even as a believer and as a follower of Christ, I don't think Paul would have been an easy person. I really, I really don't. And we see that, uh, we see that even here. We may not get that far, but when it comes to the end of this section in verse 31 and verse 32, um, after Saul makes it to Jerusalem, it says, then they tried to kill him, and then finally the disciples send him off. And you know what it says? And I just laugh when I read this. It says, and then the church enjoyed peace. <laughs> <laughs> and so it really does, it makes me, makes me think about that. I mean, wherever he was, in a good way, in a good way, Saul was just a rabble rouser, if you will. I mean, he stirred things up in a, in a, good, in a good way, in a good way. I was thinking about that, and we'll, we may not get that far today, so I want to go ahead and say it, because I didn't say it in the first service. I was listening to, uh, it was on YouTube, I was listening to an interview um, of one of the great preachers and authors, a British author who passed away, I think in the, maybe in the 80s, Leonard Ravenhill. And some of you may have, you may not have heard of him. He comes from a particular tradition, but just a wonderful, wonderful man of God. And he was interviewed in the later years of his life. And he said something that really struck me. And he said, and he, he wasn't kidding around either. This was really a man of God. He said, I want to be one of the ten most wanted men in hell. And I, I, I thought to myself, yep. And, I thought, and I'll bet you Paul was, for sure, for sure. Um, I, I, wonder, I wonder where we are on the devil's hit list. We'd rather not be on the devil's hit list at all, right? Let's have peace. Let's have peace. But for sure, if you are all out for God, and this is not to, this is not to scare you, but if you're all out for God, the enemy's all out for you too because he wants to limit, he wants to limit 
God's work if he can and make ineffective God's people. But you need not fear. I'm getting ahead of myself on my notes right now, but I want to go ahead and say it to you now. You need not fear if you are 100% for God. Be uh, you need not fear the enemy if you are 100% for God because God will be 100% for you. And God's 100% is so much greater than the devil's 100% against you. You need not be afraid. And so here we see this Saul that who thinks I'm doing a great thing for God, but actually he's 100% in the other direction, isn't he? And he is going to be, when he turns for God, he's going to be 100%. I, I, some of you have heard my dad, who was one of the, as you know, one of the founders of the church as well. You've heard dad say this before. Dad became a believer in his mid-twenties. He'd been in the military, and dad was, um, he, he loved living as he lived. But he, and he was around religious people, but I remember dad saying in his testimony, he said, he said, I decided, he said, I knew the difference, and he said, I didn't want to be a Christian. This was in it before. He said, I didn't want to be part of that. He said, and I decided until and unless I was that, I was going to be all I was in the world. But if I ever did that, then I was going to be all that way as well. And when he made that decision, that's, that, that's what happened. And that's what God wants for us as well. That's what God wants for us. And we see this beautiful picture in the life of Saul. Not that you or I not that we are called to be a Saul. Everybody's calling is different. Each one of us is different. If you want to think of yourself in this way, go ahead and think of, think of yourself as a snowflake if you want to. <laughs> some of you understand and some of you are saying, what? Because all snowflakes are different, aren't they? No, no one snowflake is like another s snowflake. We're all different, and God made us all different. And so God has called us to be what we are, and he will use us as we are. So here we see Saul's campaign. Um, I won't go through all the things again, but just as a reminder, so campaign, um, and it was, a, it was a tough one, wasn't it? It was an all-out one with every breath, eager to kill the Lord's followers. He wants to go off to Damascus, bring them back, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So he is fully convinced that he is right. We know later that he will say, but I did this in ignorance and unbelief. But what I want you to see is this. He believes he's right. He believes what he's doing is right. He believes he's going in the right direction. Why do I stress that to you this morning? We didn't talk about that so much last week. Why do I stress that? Because I think the trajectory of Saul's life, these four C's that we're talking about this morning, in fact, I believe this is a pattern for every life. I really do. This is a pattern for every life. You say, well, no, there are no Saul's at Lighthouse. None of us are that bad. None of us are that zealous in the wrong direction. But we see in Saul somebody who is deceived and going in a way that he thinks is okay, that he thinks is right. I think people, until they come to the point of the next C, which is the confrontation, you can go ahead and put that up as well, this confrontation, this violent confrontation that God has with Saul on the Damascus Road, I think this describes everyone until and unless they come to a confrontation with God and with truth and make a decision. And let me, let me go a little bit further. If you are a Christian this morning, I want you to think of what you were like before you were a Christian. If, when, before you began to follow Jesus, remember what it was like? Or think about people that you meet every day. They are sold out to their work, are they not? Work, 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 work. Or they, maybe they're sold out to their pleasure. Or I work hard and I play hard as well, right? Since I work so hard, I deserve to play hard as well. And they're sold out, they're fully, they're going full steam down this road. And they may be deceived, they may feel like this is the way to go, I gotta make money. I've got to get ahead while I can get ahead. I've got to do it this way. And then later maybe I'll do it differently. So they may be deceived or they may just be distracted. I think we live in a world of people that are distracted by the enemy that instead of coming to the point of realizing this is what life is, this is what life isn't, this is what is important, this is what isn't important, we can be so distracted by various things that our priorities get mixed up. And I think Hong, not just Hong Kong, any place, any, any place 
is open to that. I think Hong Kong is especially open to that. There's so much pressure, isn't there, here. There's pressure to, to, to make it, to get ahead, to work long, long hours. I, 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 I talk with some people that it's expected you work until midnight or later it, in, a, in an office, most common thing in the world. Those of you who are parents, you know the pressure right now, and I, and I don't want anyone to feel, to feel, I'm not pointing any fingers, but you know, I've heard from you, I've heard you talk about it. The pressure in Hong Kong, if, in the Hong Kong schooling system, if you have a child in the Hong Kong schooling system, the pressure to, you gotta, you gotta do this, you've got to have all these extra classes, you must have all of these extracurricular activities, and so many people feel the pressure, well, I've got to do this. Well, later on, I'll, we'll get, we'll change our priorities, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be more involved, and then later on, but right now, we've got to do it this way, because if we don't do it this way, then they won't get in the right secondary school. And if they don't get in the right secondary school, then they won't get in the right university. And if they don't get in the right university, then they won't get the right job. And if they don't get the right job, well then, what is their life going to be, right? And, and you know what I'm talking about. And what I want to say, what I want us to see this morning is, we look at Saul and we think, wow, how could somebody be like a Saul? But so many of us are either deceived or distracted by the things in this world as well. And we go our own way. We have, if you will, we have our own campaign. I go down this road. I go down that road. God in His love, God in His love will bring us to a point of confrontation. Aren't you glad that He loves us enough to come face to face? It may not be as dramatic as this unless we are extremely strong-willed and determined. Some of us are extremely strong-willed and determined, aren't we? Right? Some of you are laughing now because you know that's, de that's describing you. Others of us, our confrontation with the Lord was a lot more gentle. We sort of, you know, we sort of eased into it. It didn't feel like such a slap in the face. But for some of us here, we came to a point of crisis in our lives and it made us look to the Lord, right? There are some of you sitting here this morning, when you came to the Lord or came back to the Lord, your marriages were in trouble. Your health was failing. Your finances were abysmal or whatever. Any one of these things. And God in His love and mercy will bring us to those points, their confrontations, so that we can meet face to face with Him. And what I have found in confrontations, and I don't want you to be... Let me just say it this way. What I have found in confrontations is we begin to see Jesus and God for who He really is, don't we? We say, oh, God, this is who you are. But I think we also, in confrontations, we begin to see ourselves for what we are as well, don't we? Have you ever been confronted with yourself? You know, you sometimes think, well, I'm not so bad. I'm this and I'm that. And then something happens and something comes out of you and you think, oh, where did that come from? It's so horrifying. It's so awful. It's so unchristian or not nice, if you, want to, if you want to think of it that way. And confrontations help us to see the truth about God and about ourselves. And thank the Lord for that. Because if we don't understand the truth and see the truth about God and about ourselves, we will never come to the point where we, need, where we feel, I've got to do something about it. And that's what we see next. Uh, Saul says, who are you? And he says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. And then we come to the point of conversion. You, some people say, well, no, Saul wasn't converted on the road to Damascus. Saul was converted when he was in Damascus. And then Ananias went and prayed for him. And you could look at it that way, but me, I look at this, and I think Saul got saved. I think Saul was converted right here. You know why? Because then Saul gives up his campaign, doesn't he? Does he give up his campaign? This is what I'm going to do. What does he say? What shall I do? What shall I do? And unless you and I come to the place in a conversion, whatever you want to call it, where you and I 
You can call it whatever you want to. You can call it humbling yourself. You can call it submitting. You can call it surrender. You can call it giving up. You come to the place, you and I come to the place where we give up what we're doing and the way we're going and our path and our plans and all of these things and we say to the Lord about our lives, about ourselves, about our pocketbooks, about our friendships, about our jobs, about our time, about everything, what shall I do? What shall I do? I kind of think some of us need a little more conversion in our lives. You know what I mean? I know there's a point of conversion, but I think some of us, we are, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, but we're still holding on to all these things, aren't we? But Saul comes to the point, it's complete, it's complete. What shall I do, Lord? And he gives up everything. He gives up everything at this point. We talked about this more in the first service last time, but I, I like this. I, you know, we read the story of, of Saul and it seems so dramatic and not a hint of humor anywhere in this story, in this event. But I think God's kind of funny. I really do. Saul says, what shall I do? And the Lord replied, get up. That's the first thing, right? We talked a bit about this. Why? Saul is down on the dirt in, the, in, a, in a road, right? And he's, what shall I do? Well, get up, first of all. You, know, you can't stay in the middle of the road. You're going to get run over by a donkey or a mule or so, a cart or something like that. Get up, go into the city. And we see this, this wonderful picture. Um, God, gives, God gives direction, I think, on two levels. And that should encourage us. I, I meet people that only ask God for the small things. Help me with this, help me with this, help me with this. God, what should I do? And all the big things they figure out for themselves. Then I meet other people that never ask God for day-to-day -day things. They never, it's like, I, I, you know, I'll figure that out myself. The big things, I'll ask God. Um, I think God loves us so much and cares about our lives so much that he welcomes us to come to him and ask about all these things in our lives. And as we listen and as we follow and as we obey, he gives, he gives help and he gives guidance and he gives direction. And the Lord does that certainly with Saul. He says, get up, so uh, go into the city and there you'll be told what you must do. If we, you read a little bit later, you'll find out that actually we don't hear the whole story here, but in fact, God gives Saul some idea of what it's going to be ahead, which, which I think is, is, that helps us to understand how God speaks to us as well. Listen, God's direction for you, when you're really earnestly seeking the Lord, God's direction for you, I believe, will never come 100% from some source outside of you. Somebody coming to you and say, the Lord's will for you is this. Be I, I mean it. You, you need to be careful about things like that. You really do. You can get into all sorts of problems with that sort of thing. But if you're sincere and you're talking to the Lord, the Lord will begin speaking to your heart. He really will. And now somebody, you may, somebody may come along then and say, I feel that the Lord, whatever, and it will be a confirmation. I spoke with somebody by phone this week and I felt to say they were praying about a specific decision and I, I didn't know, if, I didn't know that if they were praying or not or whatever, but I had been praying for them and I just said, I said, you know what, I think, and I didn't, e I didn't even make it real spiritual, I said, I, I think you should whatever. You know what they said? Immediately, immediately, they said, that confirms what I was feeling. That con that's, that's what I was feeling, but I, <laughs> well, thank you. Well, it wasn't me, it's God, because God cares about that person's life. And it wasn't a big thing, it was a rather small thing. But it was important to that person, and it's important to God. And so we see this conversion. Saul goes off. He's taken off to the city. He's definitely humbled. He was going to go off as a conqueror into this city. Instead, he is led as a child almost, right? Um, and notice this as well. We talked about this last time. He has been struck blind, and he has no idea whether or not he will see again. Personally, I think that he expects his blindness to remain. That's, that's what I think. We don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I think Saul has no reason to think that his sight will return. And as I said, I think Saul would have accepted it completely because of his former life, because of his former life. So he goes into the city 
and then he is there on an absolute fast. He didn't eat or drink. There's, not, there's nothing supernatural about that. Okay, can you see at the bottom, that's in verse 9. So no water, no food, three days. Um, and wait, and I imagine during this time, God is dealing with him about his life, about his heart. How many of you remember you got saved, you really gave your heart to the Lord, and there was that dramatic change, there was the overflowing joy, but still, as you began to walk with the Lord, you realized, wow, there's a lot that needs changing in my life. Yeah? Uh, yeah, all of us, all of us. And you go a little bit further and you think, ah, there's more that needs changing. There is a, there's a process when we are saved. We're saved instantly. It's, it's, a, it's called a new birth. It's called a new birth. There's a moment of birth. But there is an ongoing process as God continues to work on us. So here we have the campaign, the confrontation, and the conversion. And then later on, when, Paul, when Saul Paul talks about this, he talks about the change in his life, and he talks about the change in his, his values as well. And let's look at that. It's in Philippians. He's writing to the church in Philippi in chapter 3. Um, he talks about all the things that were important to him. So I want to ask you a question. I'm, not going, to re I'm going to give you here quite a few verses, but I'm not going to read everything. You can just, uh, he, he talks about what was important to him that he's from Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. That was the most zealous, and they kept the law. He obeyed it without fault. He says, those things were important to me, but now I think they're worth nothing because of Christ. Were those things valuable? Yes, yes, and that's what I want us to see. They were valuable, but Saul doesn't compare in the way that we compare. Saul compared everything in his life, Paul compared everything in his life to Christ, to Christ. That's the comparison. And he says, but now I think they're worth nothing. Why? Because of Christ. Because of Christ. That's a pretty good comparison for us, brothers and sisters. And if you want to think of it, you can think of it as, as scales. You know, the old-fashioned scales where there's, this is on one side, this is on the other side. And then he goes further and he says... Uh, look at the next part of this passage, and I chose a different translation. I think this is the New Century version. It's a different, because I wanted you to see a little bit. He says, I think everything is worth nothing compared with the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I've lost all those things, and now I know they're worthless trash. So he doesn't mind losing them, because he's doing a comparison here, right? Look at this right at the end, and I love what he says. It helps us to see what, what is going on in his mind. He says, this because I can lose those things and not value them, this allows me to have Christ and to belong to Him. So my question for us this morning is this. Do you have Christ and do you belong to Him? Before you quickly and easily say, yes, of course, I'm a churchgoer, I'm part of Lighthouse, I'm a Christian. It's not that easy. Because part of that is these other things in my life, they're not worth. They're not of value in the same way as knowing Christ. If I can let these other things go, it means I can have Christ and I can belong to Him. So the question that goes with it is, are there things that you and I are holding on to in our lives that we're holding with our hands, that we're holding on to tightly, that keep us from holding on to Christ? I think that's the question for us. I think that's the question for us. And it's, it's something we need to think about, and it's a choice and it's a decision we have to make. God will never come to you if you're holding on to things that are keeping you from holding on to Him. He will never come to you and He will never say, Give me that! and pull it out of your hands. He could. He's a strong God and a big God, but that's not how God works. God works in relationship, and he, he lets us choose Him because He chooses us. And so He comes to us, and so the question is for us, are you holding on to things? Am I holding on to things this morning that are keeping me from really holding on to Christ and, being, and, and having Him and having Him hold on to me? And that's a question each one of us has to answer individually. And then he says, now I'm right with God. Are you right with God this morning? Are you right with God? How do you know you're right with God? 
Are you right with God because, well, I'm a member of a church? I'm right with God because, well, I'm not a heathen. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't cheated on my partner or my husband or my wife. Um, I haven't stolen money from work. I give money to church. I, I give offerings. I do good deeds. I help people. Those things are good, but they don't make us right with God. What does Paul say? Now I'm right with God because I believed in Christ. Because I believed in Christ. That's what makes us right with God. And that's what we have to come to. And you say, well, that's pretty exclusive. Yes, it is. That's the only thing that makes us right with God. It's believing in Christ. Paul, who was rich in ways perhaps that you and I will never be, and I want you to see that. I, I, I look around, I don't, I don't know. Is anybody really wealthy here this morning? Keith, I don't know about your brother and sister-in-law. They may be extremely wealthy. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know them so well or whatever. He, he does this, okay? Um, in, in, in physical ways or whatever. Look at Paul's wealth in, in his culture and in his society. As a Jew of Jews, as a Hebrew of Hebrews, as a tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, as a keeper of the law. In his culture, I want, to, I want us to understand that. In his culture, Paul would have been considered extremely wealthy. Does that make sense? He would have, had rich, he would have been at the top of the heap at the top of the heap. But he says, he says, forget that. I have something better. I have something better in Christ because I have, I have Christ now. I've believed in Christ. So this is beautiful picture of what happens in Saul's life as he is confronted and as he is converted. May I say something to you this morning? Church cannot do this in your life. Religious activity cannot do this in your life. Only one thing can do this in your life. Um, I want you to, we won't get there this morning, so I want to go ahead and flip over to it. Give me, give me slide. I want to go ahead and look at that. Give me slide, uh, slide 10. Slide 10. There's only one thing that can do that. I'm jumping ahead. Can you find it? Slide 10. Romans 1, 16. Look at this, what Paul says much, much later. These, the, you know these so well, but it fits so well with what we just said. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because what? It is the power of God. Only the power of God, brothers and sisters, makes this transformation. Good deeds can't. Uh, 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 coming to church cannot. Giving offerings can't. These things don't change us. What changes us is the power of God. And that's why in 2 Corinthians, when he writes to the church at Corinth for the second letter, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That's why Saul or Paul, who was a murderer and a blasphemer and an arrogant man, you say, well, those are tough words, Pastor. That's what Paul said about himself. That's why he can say, the old is gone, the new has come because I'm in Christ. That's why Saul slash Paul could serve the Lord with all of his heart, could stand in front of people and proclaim the glory of God and the salvation of God. I want to ask you something this morning. How many of you, you've started to follow the Lord, you're trying to, to serve Him, you're trying to give Him your life, and you fail and you fall and you mess up and you feel so guilt-ridden and you feel so unworthy that you're just, it's almost like you're just bound. Well, I can't, I'm not good enough, I can't. I'm this and I'm that and I'm, I'm just, because look what I've done, look what I've done. If you are in Christ, you're a new creation. You're a new creation. You go to Him, you confess it, He takes care of it. And then you get up out of the dirt and you keep on going. The power of God changes us. The power of God and the love of God forgives us. Keep on going. Don't let your failures, your falling, your whatever, keep you from being who God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. I mean it. I mean it. If anybody could have stayed in a corner for the rest of his life, it was Saul, right? For sure. He could have said, I'm unworthy, 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 unworthy. He never forgot who he was in the past, but he never forgot who he had become. I think I said this last week, let me say it again, not even a Christian, I think it was Oscar Wilde that said it, go figure, and he said, 
Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. How great is that? How great is that? Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. Praise the Lord. Get up out of the dirt and the dust and keep going and fulfill God's calling in your life. And so we see this in the life of Paul. Now we'll go all the way back to where we were again. And uh, we go all the way back to slide three. They take him into Damascus, and there's a believer in Damascus who's named Ananias. And he was, if you look carefully, I've included it from chapter 22 and 26. He was a devout observer of the law. So he believed in Jesus, but he was also part of a synagogue as well. Does that make sense? He was, a, he was a devout observer of the law, highly respected by all the Jews. So that meant he was a member in good standing in some of the synagogues. But he also believed in Jesus. And so the Lord spoke to him a vision calling, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. How many of you would want the Lord to speak to you in a vision? Yes? <laughs> Me too. Go slow there, my brothers and sisters. <laughs> any t almost any time in the Bible, the Lord has called somebody's name in a vision. It's been something tough. Abraham, yes, Lord, here I am. Give me your son, Isaac. Moses, yes, Lord. Go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And so on. But Ananias answers, who is this guy, Ananias? He's kind of a nobody. You know what I think that means? He's kind of like us, isn't he? You know, we're not the big church in Hong Kong. There's some great churches in Hong Kong, but Lighthouse is not one of the big churches. Pastor Nay, are you particularly famous in Hong Kong? <laughs> not particularly. I'm not particularly famous in Hong Kong. We're not a whatever. I, who cares? Look at what God can do with one person. One person, brothers and sisters, who is faithful and obedient. And we see what happens next. The Lord speaks to him, and he says, go over to Straight Street. By the way, have any of you ever visited Damascus before? So, there was somebody last week that said, yes, they were in Damascus before. Do you know that Straight Street is still there? It's still there. It's part of the, one of the bazaars, one of the main bazaars in the city. And he says to the house of Judas, when you get there, okay, here's the funny part. I told you God has a sense of humor. Ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. That's like saying... Uh, go over there and ask for uh, Carrie Lam, since we're in Hong Kong, right? Ask for a woman named Carrie Lam. Anybody not know who Carrie Lam is? We should. We should know our leaders because we're supposed to pray for them, right? And she needs prayer, okay? That, that's kind of what God is saying to Ananias. Of course he knows who Saul of Tarsus is, right? He says, and here's this beautiful picture. He is praying to me right now. He's praying. He's praying. I have shown him in a vision. He can't back out now. A man named Ananias. Oh, fooey. Lord, I was going to say, uh, send Keith instead of me, <laughs> Lord. Send somebody else. But he says, I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias. And not only that, who's going to come in and lay hands so he can see again. He was blind. <sighs> but Lord, what if? <laughs> what if? And so and that's why I think God chooses the unlikeliest people at times. God chooses, please don't take this the wrong way, but God chooses nobodies that are not whoo, important in this world. And I'll show you why. What comes next? Uh, next slide. We come to the calling. Uh, go over, next slide. Mission Impossible. You say, why, why is the title slide in the middle? as we are right near the end of the message. It's because it's this is where the Lord gave it to me as I, was pray, as I was praying and preparing yesterday because I always used to watch this. It was a television show long before it was a movie when all of you were not even born. It was a television show in America. Same music. Keith, who's not so young, remembers it also, right? And, you, and so some of you do as well, okay. But I thought of it because there are so many Mission Impossibles in this story. Saul is mission impossible. Do you have any mission impossibles in your life? Some people who are mission impossibles? Do you have any situations in your life that are mission impossibles? Well, that's what Ananias thinks because look at the next slide. What do we see? 
we come into the calling. Ananias says, wait, Lord. But the Lord says, he says, but the Lord said, click. But the Lord said, go. Can we come into the calling? This is the final part as we come to a close. We're going to go about, th about four more minutes, okay? And he says, but the Lord said, go. Why? Look at the first one. For Saul is my chosen instrument. Number one, Saul's my chosen instrument. This word instrument, and now I'm going to drink. I'm going to drink from an instrument. You say, Pastor Jennifer, that's a cup. Yes, it is. But it's also, it's a vessel, an instrument. And this word instrument means, when God uses it, this word, this Greek word, means a vessel or a cup or something like that. And he says, Saul is my chosen instrument. Pause there just a minute before we go any further. And this should encourage you this morning. So here is this instrument, this vessel. Uh, Helen Motti gave this to me many, many years ago, right before they left. It was after I'd preached a sermon about it. And I, what is in here? There's water in here. And this instrument, this vessel, there's this on the outside. But what is helpful to me, what I'm using is what's inside, right? It's what's inside. And God says, Saul is my chosen instrument, my chosen vessel. You and I feel so unworthy. We feel so powerless. We feel so unskilled. We feel so inadequate to do things for God, to do the work that God has called us to do. Do you ever feel that way? I do. But you are God's chosen instrument. That's the outside part. And God takes you and God takes me. And then God puts himself in us. God puts who he is, his strength, his ability, his love. When I cannot love someone, he puts his love in me. It's a vessel. He fills me with himself. And when God fills us with himself, we are more than conquerors. We are more than able. We are more than adequate. We are more than powerful. We are more than all of the things to do what God has called us to do. It's not our calling. It's God's calling. But he has to use people, doesn't he? He has to use you and he has to use me. He had to use Saul. And he says, no, you go. God. Saul is my chosen instrument. First, number one. Secondly, what's next? He says to take my message to the Gentiles, to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. That's number two. This is what he, specifics of what he's going to do. And then number three, what does he say? And I will show him how much he must suffer. You see, God was calling Saul to a great and high and mighty, mighty work. Here we are 2,000 years later, and we still honor and revere Paul, don't we, in many ways, for what he did. But he paid a price. He paid a price for it. And the highest and the best things of God, listen, will require the highest and best things of us. Yeah, they will. They will. It's our choice. God calls. Now, as we come to a close, I ask you, when you look at these three things, Saul is my chosen instrument. This is where he will take my message, and he will suffer greatly for my name's sake. You know the book of Acts, and you know the New Testament. Do these three things describe Paul's life? Yes or no? Yes. To a T, completely, exactly. And so if you look on your sheet, the very last part where it says the calling, this is the calling of Saul. He can say yes or he can say no. You see a calling, does that make sense? To, that's why I like the word calling, because you don't have to answer a call. We don't have to answer a call if we don't want to. What does God call us to? It may be to be, um, to be it, it, it's, it will seldom be, it won't be what Saul's calling was. It's, you'll be called to something else. What are the gifts that you have? What are the things that you love to do? What brings you satisfaction in relation to other people? This will point you to God's call in your life. It really will. It will point you to God's call. You see, God put those things in you. Oh, because God made the vessel. Did he not? He made the instrument. But then he puts himself in that. And he says, this is the call. And so Ananias goes. 
he lays hands on him. Let's go to the next part. And that's, that's the call. And we talked about this. We closed with this last time, but I've added more. Saul Ananias goes to him. He lays hands on him. I, I told the first service, we don't really understand how serious this is. We think, well, Anna, why didn't Ananias say yes right away? Um, uh, one, one commentator said the importance of this w would have been d like a German Jew during World War II going to Adolf Hitler to pray for him. That's, what it, that's how serious it would have been. That's what it would have been like because that was, that was, Paul's, that was Saul's reputation. But he goes, he's faithful to do this. Does Ananias know exactly what Saul is going to become? No, he just goes. When God leads you and calls you and calls me to do things, it may be small or it may be large, you and I, we, we don't know the importance. We really don't. What God needs from us, and He doesn't always tell us the importance. What God wants is just obedience from us. You don't know what God will do with your step of, okay, God, I'll go. You don't. You don't. God knows. God knows. Find your calling in God. Find your calling. What's He calling you to? And then do it. Do it. Are you doing it? Do you know it? Are you at least thinking about it? There's no greater fulfillment. Paul comes to the end of his life. Uh, do I even have the slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me slide eight. We close there. Slide eight, please. That's uh, 1 Timothy. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. Wow. How many of us would have chosen Timothy, uh, Paul's work? Not me. He was almost killed many times. He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a poisonous snake. He was stoned. He was lashed. He was mocked. He was almost torn limb from limb. You name it, it happened to him. And he says at the end of his life, I thank the Lord. He gave me strength to do his work. He gave me strength to do his work. And we'll come to this next time we come back to it. But in the end, he says, he says, Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst of them all. I'm the worst. You think you're really bad and you're really terrible? You can't be the worst. You can only be assistant worst. <laughs> Paul's the worst. Paul's the worst. But, oh, but God had mercy. God had mercy just as God has mercy on us. Let's close in prayer this morning. Amen. What is the Holy Spirit saying? We, we, look, we talked about a lot of things, but what's the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? There are different things that may have touched your heart this morning. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning? Is your campaign in a, di a direction that's different from the Lord, going your own way? Maybe you've been deceived or distracted and you're kind of going down your pathway by yourself and the Lord is confronting you this morning. Or there's some things you need to let go of so that you can have Christ, as Paul says. Or do you need to come to the place where you say, Lord, I've been floating along and I have not sat down and gotten serious with you about your calling on my life and I want to. I want to. Or are you in the place of Ananias where the Lord is really, there's some specific things God is asking you to do and you've just been slow and hesitant and you don't know what, what depends on your obedience in these areas with, with people in your life. Lord, we come to you this morning and Lord, we pray, Lord, I pray that you would continue to speak your word to people's hearts, confirm your word to people's hearts your confrontation to people's hearts, your calling to people's hearts. May we respond in obedience. May we not get up and walk out of here and say, okay, that, was, that wasn't too bad, and go about our way without, without responding to what you have said to us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.